What did you have in the back of your mind when you decided to bring TEDx to Armenia? When I was um, starting TEDx, when I applied for the license, and I have to say that it's not only thanks to me, it's thanks to Alexis Ohanyan, the co-organizer and the co-founder of TEDx Yerevan, that we have TEDx Yerevan. But uh, when I started it, I didn't have any idea what was TED. And I was just the founder of uh, neuroscience and human brain, and I was checking loads of information online, and I discovered TED Talks. My first TED Talk was uh, um, Bull Taylor's talk on how she was having a stroke and being a neuroscientist. She was able to basically study what was happening in her brain from inside. It's an amazing talk. I highly recommend you to check it. And uh, I should say that, you know, it sounds a bit funny, but my drive for it was purely egocentric. I did it for myself because I was really hungry for quality information, for um, new ideas, for freedom of ideas, for accessibility of ideas because, you know, it's a shame the whole amazing palitra of research, scientific researches are done by public funds, but we don't have access to them. Number one, yeah, and I wish it was changed. Secondly, you know, all the coolest and best uh, pieces of information, you have to pay for it. You have to pay for the education and everything. So I was kind of mad and, you know, I really wanted something new and fresh. I was quite thirsty, and until now I'm very thirsty with, with that um, uh, possibilities. And uh, whenever I find an opportunity to, you know, dig out something new and fresh and with uh, better quality and with accessibility, I go for it, and that was the reason. And, but the story was really amazing because at that point I was not even thinking that I would get an opportunity to do TEDx event. I was just translating TED Talks, and I happened to translate Alexis Ohanian's talk. And I should say it was funny, but he was speaking in slang, you know, and I was like, you know, finally I found an Armenian, uh, the only Armenian speaker at that point on TED website was Alexis, and he was speaking in slang. There were parts in the talk that I couldn't translate. So I wrote to him, uh, um, basically I tried to reach out and say, you know, I've translated your talks, people should know about you in Armenia. It was 10 years back. And, you know, could you help me to translate these phrases? And very funny phrases, you know, really. And of course I didn't get any reply. And then I thought like, of course, who I am that he replies me. And then I thought, okay, uh, I'm no one and it's a very good position you know, to feel yourself to be no one, because you don't have to limit yourself with anything. You don't have to feel shy, no responsibilities, absolute freedom. So I checked, I saw that he's coming to Armenia through an organization which is called Keva. I wrote a letter, very angry letter to them. I said, you know, he didn't even reply to my email. It's very unrespectful, <laughs> but I am expecting a reply. And basically, that's how after a while, of course, he's a busy guy, you know. And they wrote me immediately. They said, he'll reply to you. Sorry, he's busy. He's arranging everything. And of course, then I got a call when he was in Armenia. He said, let's meet. Uh, you know, I got prepared, very official meeting. You know, Alexis Ohanyan, the big guy. Well, nothing like that. Uh, a very human human. You know, it was a feeling of really dealing with the nature as our dear speaker in <laughs> Open Mind Match. It was like human nature experience, and I think that's how it opened my mind. I think he has been one of the best coaches that I have ever had. He can teach a lot, because that was his attitude. You don't have to ask any permission from anyone if you want to do something good, or you have a big dream, or you have a desire, you want to do something. I think that's what I learned from him, and I, I went for that. We translated the talk, and he, I told him that I've applied for the licensee, and I don't have any reply from Ted. And I've also told him that I've done a number of things. At that point, I was showing some Ted Talks to kids in, in, at schools and discussing Ted Talks about brain and everything with <laughs> kids of uh, first or second um, form. Alexis said, you know, you have done a lot. I have to write them a note so they know that you have done already a lot and you need their support. So at that point already he 
manage to send the uh, email. Another thing that he would do, you, you wouldn't manage to say something, he would turn it into an action. Secret of his success, I guess. And basically that's how after a while we got the license, we did, there has been organizations that supported us, lots of them are here right now. And I, I, I can say that the <laughs> being here today is also part of a dream because you know, who would ever dream that your students will organize this event? Not me, uh, this is not my event. This is the event of my students and our mentorship program, and I uh, want to acknowledge Craig and Emma and the rest of the amazing team that have organized this event for all of us. And I had the privilege to be uh, in the audience. And imagine the deputy minister is our host, and so many amazing people are speakers. What could be better than that? So thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, you touched upon about uh, so many important and interesting issues, but I'll go for two more questions. Last year when we met, you were, and you still are, so passionately talking about educational neuroscience, about the learning processes, that you've literally infected me. And this has been one of the foundational principles for the education reform that we have in the country now. How did you get to that? What is it that has given you this insight of looking into this marriage or a child of uh, education research and neuroscience? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a long story, but just to keep it very short, um, um, apart from being educator or, you know, lecturer myself and uh, also being a TED um, fan and advocate, um, I've, I've, I'm a change management consultant as well, 20 years already, and part of that is that you have to know a lot about organizational psychology and behavioral patterns that are happening within the organization, lots of interesting stuff. That's how I got uh, actually addicted and um, digged a lot. And then, you know, I realized that it's not enough. You shouldn't look into it from only purely uh, um, psychological perspective. There is more to that, and that's the nature, and that's the human brain and the biology. And uh, basically, I started to dig into it. I have to say that ha there has been also a personal story behind it. I had, I had some challenges in my life. I, you know, I was trying to find answers, and I couldn't uh, get any answers from the professionals, including. So I was like, better I get into my own brain and see how things are working. Why is this happening? Why is this not happening? Because I'm a pretty conscious person, pretty controlled, and there are things that, you know, um, I need to understand why and how those things are happening. And uh, it has been a pure joy and I would say addiction and love from the very first sight. And uh, um, the first things I could uh, find that were accessible and also adaptable and simple enough for me to understand, it was about, uh, it was, and they were in this uh, TED Talks that I discovered on Human Brain, but later on I took lots of online courses. Uh, some of them are just amazing, and one of the most favorite one is Wendy Suzuki's, uh, you know, class on neuroscience. And, you know, I learned, and once I was learning, I also, since I was in the education system, I was applying bits of the information that I would learn into the educational practices or, you know, teaching practices that I would uh, experiment with. And uh, one of the things that I discovered was um, research on uh, growth, um, growth mindset versus to fixed mindset. And the core of it, it was about teaching kids about human brain because she was saying that once you teach kids about brain, pure biology, nothing complicated, nothing, you don't have to go into, you know, too much of complicated stuff, but once they understand the basics of the thinking and, you know, how it's working, and how it can impact their own life, they start changing things. They believe in themselves, they give more try to succeed, they don't, uh, they're not afraid of a failure. One uh, of the best lessons that I've incorporated into my class was uh, one thing that I've told you, because once you 
tell them how uh, any capacity is being developed at the level of mm, human brain and how those neurons are, you know, being uh, forming a new pathways and a network for, for, for something new that you would do. And once the electrical signal will go through that pathway and repeat, once you repeat something, you want it or not, according to science and biology, basic principles, it's becoming a sustainable capacity for you, for every single one of us. So once I would teach that to my students, I would see they are eager to try more. They're not shy to fail. They're not afraid. And you know, at the end of the day, uh, this is kind of another passion that I have. I decided that, you know, um, I have to discover all those things that are important to teach our kids and teachers as well. And one thing that I learned from Ted, once you have an idea or, you know, any project in mind and you don't have time to do it, you tell to write people. You know, you give the ownership. You always present your ideas. That's the best thing you can do because it free up lots of new space for you to go to the next stage, you know. <laughs> so I found Nora big and <laughs> injected that and she got addicted and I'm happy for that because um, I'm mostly fond of, uh, you know, general neuroscience. She's fond of educational neuroscience and I'm fond of uh, disclosing all those neuro myths, uh, you know, that you, know, you use only 10% of your brain, N not true, lots of things that are not true that we know. So at the end of the day, I decided that I'll just write a book about, you know, my own discoveries about my own brain um, by interviewing lots of professionals and by experiencing lots of different things, by reading lots of research and also working with uh, students who are trying to be neurosurgeon and neuroscientists locally that helped me to you know, added the scientific part to make sure I don't say something and it would turn another neuro myth for all of us to believe. And um, that's basically it, but educational neuroscience is something totally new and fresh for me as well, and I hope that we'll um, have something in the reform to consider that because uh, it's really important since we have this new revolution and there is this concept of cognitive liberty. I don't know if you heard about that or not. When I started to dig in this field, you know, I would always think that I thought it was my idea. You know, it's funny. I love that part as well. Every time I think I have a new idea, I discover someone else already has that idea. And when I was working on this book, I thought, you know, it's a basic human right. It should be in the convention, human rights convention, that everyone needs to know, you know, have, needs to have this right to know about their brain first. Because if you don't know, it's an open, you know, space and it's open, uh, you know, um, device, I would say, and everyone has uh, power to influence it. So you really need to know how it's working so you don't get influenced much. And negatively, I would say. Positively, you can always be open. So, uh, and then I discovered that there is this concept of cognitive liberty, which means that you have the right to privacy on how you're thinking. Because we have the, this, uh, the right to freedom of thought, which is you have the right to think whatever you want. But there is a new concept, which is like the freedom on how you think. The thing is that all the technology development and uh, recent changes uh, will soon enable, and already enabled, you know, the access, direct access to your thoughts and brain. And we have to do something with this. And the main thing is education, I believe. That's it. Now we have a handful of auditorium that will be waiting for your book to come out to read it as soon as we can. And um, my final question. In, in, your f in answering the first question, you said that you're egoistic. That's why you have organized this all. A very fresh conceptualization of how positive an egoism can be. So, given that premise, what is a dream for you? Well, I would say one of the m biggest dreams I have, it's connected again to education. And um, I wish we would become less judgmental and more uh, 
uh, active in supporting, uh, you know, people who have the right and resources and the opportunities to change something in relation to education system in Armenia. And I wish we uh, could build a community where, you know, um, we're not judgmental on new experiments and also on freshness of the ideas and the experiences to be heard and shared. And one of the things I tried to do, it was face TEDx to build that platform where you, you, know, you, have, you give that opportunity to every single person because you never know what uh, will come out. Uh, I wish that would turn into a, a more formal and institutional format. I had the privilege to be part of their TED Innovative Educators program and many, very many other things. You know, it's it's really important to have this platform where you know you have access to the newest and freshest things happening in the world, and it doesn't mean that you have to follow every single one of them, hundred percent no. But you know, at least when you have information on all this, you are able again to be more mindful and conscious and uh, um, realistic on the developments and uh, trends that are hitting all of us and uh, future generations and our kids. So that's basically about the dream. Uh, I wish more support for my students who would do this kind of uh, in events. Other than that, I don't think I really need much because I have everything I need. <laughs> Thank you. Christine, thank you so much. I'm sure you will be gaining hearts and minds of people like you've been doing so far. Thank you so much.